Well, I guess I should have seen this coming. At the beginning of the month, I made a poll asking everyone if you would rather see me create a video talking about the history of Terra Birds or the next installment in the history of the Earth. And although the History of the Earth series did win, I have to say, not many subjects on this channel can give that series a run for its money. But somehow, the Terra Birds managed to walk away with 46% of the vote. So that's still like 3,500 people. And that's something that I cannot ignore. So I want to tell you all now that for those of you who did vote for the Forest Rockets to get their own video, that one will be coming. In fact, it has now been moved up to one of my top priorities once a free moment becomes available. I just only had time to do one or the other this month before other obligations come up. So stay tuned. But for now, we come to the tail end of the Paleozoic era. It's truly staggering how much time this series has traversed so far. From cyanobacteria first forming from the earliest building blocks of DNA, to the tiny microbial ancestors of all the major phylums on Earth. We covered the rise of complex multicellular animals in the Ediacaran and the Cambrian explosion, and ever since then, it has seemed like the torch of world domination has been passed every couple of million years. Starting in the oceans with the radiodonts, to the cephalopods, to the eurypterids, to the placoderms. And all this conflict beneath the waves had led to different groups slowly colonizing the land. And by the time we get to the Carboniferous, we see our very first thriving terrestrial global ecosystem, in the form of a rainforest that extended from pole to pole. But every time that life started to become well established, something would happen that would seem to be like nature hitting the reset button. The climate, the atmosphere, or the continents moving around has always seemed to shuffle the cards, and every time new animals would end up on top. And most recently, it seemed like our ancestors were finally being dealt a good hand. Which brings us to 298 million years ago, as the world started to become cooler and drier. For the quickly diversifying amniotes, this was their time, as we begin our journey through the Permian. Going into the Permian, the continents were continuing on the same path that they had started on millions of years before, and this would lead to several changes to both the climate and the landscape. For one thing, the land masses of Gondwana and Euroamerica had finally come together. This resulted in the formation of mountain ranges where the two plates met. The tectonic forces generated by this were likely some of the most powerful seen on Earth since the Hadean and Archean eons. Now one thing about large mountain ranges is that they can have a very drastic effect on the regional climate. Because if a mountain range becomes tall enough, it can literally block moisture from getting past it. That's why when you look at a map, oftentimes you'll see that on one side of the mountain range there will be dense forests, while on the opposite side you'll see drier, more arid conditions. This is called the rain shadow effect. And in a situation where there was already a limited amount of water making it to the interior of the continent to begin with, this would create a situation where there would be two drastically different environments. The lush coastal tropical forests, and the massive dry interior desert. And this was probably pushed to even further extremes because there was less liquid water overall to go around on the planet because the cooling climate that had started in the late Carboniferous had now led to a full-blown ice age in the early Permian, known as the Late Paleozoic Ice Age. This one spread glaciers across the southern continent of Gondwana. So this actually led to even more climactic extremes, with so many different environments covering huge areas across this one giant landmass. And this was the perfect setting for all new branches of evolution as organisms adapt to the new world around them. But there was an issue. Up until this point, everything alive on Earth was exothermic, or cold-blooded, meaning that they needed to warm their bodies with the heat of the sun to be able to process their food and fuel themselves. Fortunately, if you're exothermic and you live on a world that is in the grip of an ice age, you're probably going to have a bad time. Luckily though, the amniotes did have a few different strategies depending on where they were adapting to live that would give them an even further edge on land. But before we get into that, let's check back in with life in the oceans. 
With the growing glaciers at the South Pole dropping the sea level, this caused the island land masses, like what would one day become China and Southeast Asia, to grow to land masses nearly the size of Australia. This isolated the Paleotethys Sea from the Panthalassic Ocean even more than before. And this likely led to a division in the evolutionary paths from the animals living in each. And I say likely, because it's hard to say 100% for sure because we don't actually have a ton of fossils from the Panthalassic Ocean during this time, at least of large animals. Almost all of what we know is from the more shallow Paleotethys. And here we see that some forms of life had managed to bounce back from the Devonian extinction and become abundant, but some were still struggling after all this time. One that still managed to hang on were the ever-persistent trilobites who, despite becoming exceedingly rare on a seafloor covered in mollusks, echinoderms, and brachiopods, were able to eke out a living in a handful of different species. They just won't die. They're like sea cockroaches. Pretty much. No matter how many times they've been knocked down, they manage to just keep chugging along. But one of the most successful invertebrates from this time was a particular kind of ammonite called goniatites. Now, this was an older order of ammonite, but it was definitely their golden age. They're so common in early Permian marine fossil layers that paleontologists actually use them as an index fossil to identify that they have the rock layers dated correctly. And getting into the vertebrates, we see that one group of fish had really moved out ahead of the others. While the lobe-finned and bony fish were very low in biodiversity, the chondrichthians were taking over and diversifying, especially a clade known as holocephaly, which is a clade that is not very well represented today, but does contain a few modern deep sea creatures like chimeras. We also see some more shark-like examples of this group start to evolve, known as the hybodonts. But based on where the fossils were found, it appeared that some of the species were taking refuge in freshwater environments from the true top predators of the ocean, the eugeniodontids. And if you thought that armored fish, sea scorpions, carrot krakens, and alien sea bugs were scary, meet Helicoprion, a shark with a buzzsaw on its face. Yeah, Major, you're scary. This whirl of teeth was something that puzzled scientists for over a hundred years because we couldn't figure out exactly how it worked. And because cartilage doesn't fossilize very well, we have yet to actually find a complete skeleton of this thing. So for a long time, we had many wild guesses of how this jaw even worked, or how it would even fit on the animal's face. But in 2013, scientists were re-examining the best fossil of Helicoprion ever found, and after CT scanning it, they settled on this as the final product of how this mess fit together. It's thought that it used this tooth whorl as a tool to hunt the most common prey available, the goniatite ammonites. But at up to 8 meters long, this animal was very likely the unchallenged king of the early Permian seas. As we come ashore to the site of the thriving coastal forests, things would appear to bear a general resemblance to the jungle world of the Carboniferous. But this was definitely a very different world. Because there was less oxygen, the age of the giant arthropods was over. But, despite their reduced size and place on the food web, they would quickly bounce back and take several new forms to fill new niches in the swampy fern-covered lands especially among the insects. This is when we start to see the very first flies and beetles in the fossil record. And considering that in the modern day, there are currently between 350 and 400,000 different species of beetle, I would say that they had figured out a set of adaptations that worked pretty well for them. And one group that managed to hit their peak during this time were the Temnospondyls. They took a hit at the end of the Carboniferous, but in the millions of years since, they had managed to make the coastal swamps and forests theirs, and radiated into several new forms. One of the most well-known is the strange hammer-headed amphibian called Diplocolis, or kind of more boomerang-headed, I guess. 
We even see old terrors like the predatory Eriops managing to hang on. And finally, we see one branch of this group that is believed to be the earliest ancestors to modern amphibians like frogs and salamanders, a creature called Cacops. Despite all this success, however, the Temnospondyls did have an issue. Even though if you measure success in biodiversity, they were doing quite well, the fact is that they could not spread to an overwhelming majority of the land because they were still tied to the water, and they would also struggle to adapt to colder regions, which at first was actually something that everything on Earth was struggling with. But perhaps the fact that the world was in the grip of an ice age was actually the thing that pushed some animals to make a change. That is one of the theories behind a standout feature that first evolved during this time period with some of the most famous Permian animals, especially one of the top predators of the early Permian, the Cephenicodontid Dimetrodon. This was one of the various different families of synapsid who were diversifying during this time. And although this species was primarily a hunter of amphibians in the swamps, where it probably mostly lived. It is thought that their ability to regulate their body temperature more effectively than any other group of tetrapods at the time is what gave them the edge in the wildly different climates of the late Paleozoic Ice Age. We're not sure if Dimetrodon's sail was an adaptation for thermoregulation or maybe just used as a sexual display. But what we do see is that there were several different animals, especially among the early synapsids, that evolved this feature independently. I mean, if I'm being honest, it could have been both. After all, we see lots of reptiles today using sails as a sexual display. But we also know that the sail would have been packed with blood vessels. So when blood moved through the thin membrane of the sail and the animal was sunning itself, the blood would start to warm. So this could have been the first steps toward the very first group of animals becoming endothermic, or warm-blooded. And this would be the thing that allows these animals to take over the world. As well as the thing that allows me to take my next form. Why do you all care if my character stands upright? Alright, now at least I don't have flounder eyes. Across the warmer, arid regions of Pangaea, the diapsids and synapsids were on the rise. And they were starting to get larger as well. This would be most evident in the first group of large herbivores to lumber across the land. The diadestids like Desmododon that have been around since the Carboniferous, along with the sail-backed herbivore Adaphosaurus, which, despite the resemblance, is actually only a distant relative of Dimetrodon. Of these groups, the ones that lived in the swamps and forests were likely prey for the sail-backed carnivore. But for the ones that expanded out into the desert, they would be facing a very different threat. Another group of carnivorous synapsids called the Dinocephalians. This was one of the first groups to rise up during the beginning of the Permian, and they started to diversify into many different forms. There were herbivores like the dome-headed Tapinocephalus, which grew to the size of a black rhino, and the largest carnivore of the period, Titanophonius, which was bigger than a tiger and had a pair of pronounced canine teeth that it would use to dispatch its prey. And there were even some species of omnivores eating a mix of both plants and animals, like Titanosuchus. There were even some that did spread into the coastal forest and become semi-aquatic, returning to the water and living similarly to crocodiles and hippos in this regard. And these would by far be the most bizarre. Like, look at this thing. It's called Estemonosuchus. And as you can see, it quite literally wears the crown for the most bizarre Permian synapsid. But to find a close runner-up, we have to look at a different member of the synapsids from the Dinocephalians altogether, the tiny-headed herbivore Catilorhychus. As you can see, through the Permian, the synapsids quickly came to dominate. 
Perhaps it was because their bodies were better suited to a wide variety of habitats during the glacial period, combined with the fact that they had more versatile dental tools that made life easier no matter what they were trying to feed on. But more specifically than the synapsids, this was the dinocephalians time to really shine. They rose to the top, and everything else was struggling to hold a place somewhere in the middle. And one group that remained small was another kind of synapsid carnivore called the Therapsids, like my new form, Biarmasuchus. This animal was a dog-sized hunter who likely couldn't stand up to monsters like Titanophonius or Dimetrodon, but it was able to make a living hunting smaller prey. And our larger-than-average eyes means that we may have been able to make a living hunting at night when many of the larger synapsids were asleep. And the same goes for Phthenosuchus. Phthenosuchus. Right, Tim Tim? Why do we keep finding ourselves in the underdog positions? I mean, we've definitely been in worse spots. At least we have a good strategy for avoiding all the stuff that wants to kill us. And plus, I happen to know that better days are coming. What was that? What? What was what? As we come around to 273 million years ago, there would then be a shift in the climate. We have seen a world populated by cold-blooded animals adapt and thrive in a world in the grip of an ice age. But it was gradually getting warmer again, and as much as the animals did an excellent job expanding into every possible niche over the past 25 million years, now those animals were specialized to the world as it was at the time. And things were not going to go as you might expect, either. One would think that the melting glaciers would lead to rising sea levels and in turn more water to spread rainfall to the interior of Pangaea. So yeah, it would get hotter, but at least there would be more liquid water to go around. But unfortunately, the way it played out was not that simple. Sea levels did rise, but the presence of the mountains that were continuing to rise as well for the past 30 million years means that even though there was more water, it was still blocked off by the mountains. So it got hotter, but if anything, it also got even drier. The only places that could get more rain were the places that really didn't need it. This probably caused widespread flooding throughout the coastal swamps and forests. And the runaway effects of this would cause around 25% of the plant species to die out. And that's never good for a food web. This would once again lead to the demise of many of the animals at the top of the food chain. Around this time, Helicoprion disappears from the world's oceans, as many of its different favored ammonite prey were becoming too rare for the giant to sustain itself. And on land, many of the Temnospondyls were falling on hard times. And so would many of the first synapsids that had previously been dominant. And this is when Dimetrodon, the most famous stem mammal of all, ran out of steam. Inland, many of the groups that came to dominate did survive, but so many species would be taken out that this was no longer the Dinocephalian's world. And there were other synapsids that were more generalized and ready to take advantage of this new hot earth. So you're probably wondering why I chose to divide the Permian in half. And if it's not already clear, it will definitely become more clear in the next episode of the series. Basically, the animals of the early and late Permian are so radically different from each other because of the extinction that took place right in the middle that it would be very hard to tell the story properly in just one episode. Plus, this script is already over 3,000 words long, and I need to get started on Paleo Rewind. So, as we go forward, we will see what synapsids manage to pull through, and how they will adapt to living on a continent that is continuing to slam together. Is the ground shaking? No. Have a good one, everybody. <laughs>